All right. It's 10. It's 10 o'clock. Let's go. Tally, kick us off. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, per usual, we'll start things off with just an AI in the news segment um, before I hand it back over to Tim for um, some introductions and kind of an overview of today's episode. Um, so the the big news item this week is actually Mind Over Machines related. We just launched um, an AI-centric uh offering called Human AI Pathways, which is really exciting. Definitely check out the website. I will link it following this um, this segment or this episode. But essentially, Human AI Pathways is our way to help bez- uh, businesses and workforce gain access to um, a deeper understanding of AI. So we use different um, strategies for this, such as uh, envisioning sessions to help the uh, different organizations ideate on how to best use AI, actionable recommendations based on AI insights, AI-centric innovation design thinking sessions, and then we have um, a series of different educational resources as well to help folks learn more about AI and AI in business. So that's a super exciting um, product launch that we just had this week and definitely keep your eyes peeled for more information to come on this really exciting product. Awesome. Which is ties right into our guest this week, which is Jody Hume. Hello. Jody, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Jody is a uh, I don't know, I would describe you as a mastermind of change management and organizational uh, growth. So, you know, Jody, we're really excited to have you here on the on the show today to talk about AI, <coughs> AI and organizational change. Thanks, Tim. You can, you, you can introduce yeah. me any day because you call me a mastermind and bewitching. So there you, go. you, you can just intro me everywhere. <laughs> nice. I just follow you around like your Perfect. theme music. Perfect. You're like, yeah. yeah, here we go. Um <laughs> Yeah, so you know, on the on the news topic, you know, as Tally was bringing up, like human AI pathways. Um, so yesterday, I was at a uh, conference where uh, a large research institute was talking about their, you know, what they're recommending for everybody for AI and approaching AI. And there was a lot of focus on organizational alignment. It didn't mm-hmm. say it like that, but that's what it was. So you know, human AI pathways. That's what we like to do. That's that's where we're focusing is let's get you aligned. Let's start with experimentation um, mm-hmm. and go from there. So, and I know Jody is you and I've talked kind of a big deal. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, well, I mean, it it doesn't surprise me that of all of the companies who are jumping on AI. I mean, first of all, pre this huge wave of AI, if AI came up, I thought of mind over machines. And I'm not just saying that. I've been doing Tom for a while and that's kind of was in my head of <clears throat> something that was unique about you guys. So it doesn't surprise me that of all the noise and clutter there is about AI right now, that you, the way mind over machines is approaching it, is actually to back it up to the human element. The because I know that's how you guys think about everything is what, what, how are the humans involved here? And when it comes to humans, alignment is how you make things happen. When, when That's where that phrase herding cats comes from, mm-hmm. is that when people are all over the place, you it is very difficult to channel that energy into something useful. And so I, I think what gets really tricky with, um, I, I love the word alignment, it because it does feel so clean and organized, and but I think it steps over what it takes to create alignment and, and, and what that involves. Because I think when we often talk about organizational change, it, it's, it's almost a fallacy that we have separate words for it, that there is somehow this way you change an organization that happens at an organizational level, like there's a different dashboard at the organizational level that you can punch buttons and things just change, mm-hmm. when in reality, it is just a massively complex constellation of humans that you have to to get to buy into and participate in the change. And and when you think about what it takes to get one person to make even small changes in their day or their life, not even getting to the parts that we'll get to in a minute here about fears and existential threats and things that, that create resistance and friction, just any, I mean, think about your own life, smallest little changes. Those things are hard. 
hard. And now you're trying to get 100 people to change in, in tandem, in the same ways. Um, it's a big deal. And so anytime I hear somebody speaking of it lightly, like, oh, we're just going to do some change management. <laughs> like, yeah. like yeah. it's a thing you snap your fingers and it happens. I am very suspect. Um, or when they imagine it's going to happen very quickly. It, that doesn't mean it has to be laborious and daunting, but it absolutely is something that takes focus and attention and ongoing focus and attention. And I, I, I think one of the real pitfalls is when, someone, when we imagine that it just sort of like it's a set it and forget it kind of thing. Like we did some change management and then you're shocked why things are fizzling or why people are resisting or having problems. So I really love yeah. this conversation. Yeah, I, and I thought we could just make change management a light switch. You know, you just switch <laughs> and changed, you know, like it's done, right? Right, yeah. Tally? That's that's all we do, right? Just, that would, yeah, I mean, that would be that would be cool, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> when we figure that out, we'll let everybody know. So, exactly. So, <laughs> maybe the uh, brain implants, the neural link uh, implants will help with that. So, sounds dystopian. Uh, tying into our terrifying Halloween edition of the <laughs> Born AI show. But um, there's also there's been a lot of news this week, actually. So we were talking about it um, uh, before the show in the, I don't know, green room, I guess is what we'd call that, mm -hmm. um, where we're, uh, there's a, expected to be an executive order on Monday. I was reading an article about this yesterday. Um, from the Biden administration about limiting the use of uh, AI tools and algorithms for federal workers that haven't been reviewed. Like I, mm. the way I understand it, it was like peer reviewed, but I need to learn more about this. So I just, we're not going to chat a bunch about it today. I just want to put it on everybody's radar. Keep your ears open on Monday. Sounds like we might be having some news about AI regulation coming. And then Tally, um, who we're also about like, some AI regulation in the EU. Um, there's a great organization called uh, 2021.ai. Their YouTube channel, small YouTube channel, they're talking a lot about the what is the EU AI Act. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing business in the EU, check it out. It's some really important stuff to know. And also, if you're doing business in the U.S., remember with GDPR, that was the template for mm -hmm. the California Consumer Protection Act. So... You know, don't don't just kind of turn away because the EU is not where you're at today. Be mindful that uh, this stuff moves around. So, I, I mean, I think this brings up a really great point: is that there's a there's a very valid reason that change has a bad rap in the human brain, and and that's what we're really talking about here. Is like most of what gets in the way of change is is the neuroscience of what is happening in a brain and what we're wired to do from an evolution standpoint, even, but. But change is sometimes threatening. So you also can't overlook um, like valid concerns that people or organizations or countries have about a new thing. You change management. If you, if, you, if you minimize the reality of, of the fear someone has about something, it doesn't help make it go away. <laughs> right. because, because there are legitimate things to to be concerned about. And you, part of good change management is showing people that you have thought through those things, that we are mitigating risk, that we have thought about. And we'll get into this a little bit more um, when we're talking about some of this change management theory. But if you, if you or anyone you love has anxiety, um, when they are feeling super anxious, I think we all know that what does not help is saying like, well, just don't be anxious or that's not something thing to worry about. It feels like that should help, but it absolutely does not help that person. Um, what does help, and this feels so scary if you're trying to help someone else, but what does help is to acknowledge that fear as a valid thing to be afraid of. Like if that is a fair anxiety to have. I could see how that could be really scary if you name it and acknowledge it so that they feel that you see it too and that it really is there. So, you know, if we're thinking about aligning an organization to prepare for some kind of AI initiative, you know, blowing off their concerns about job safety or or just the many other concerns, we'll get into that in a second, it is, is not going to make that go away. And it seems scary right. to say, like, I see that you are nervous about that. And we see that too. We are watching for it. And so I think it can actually help people to see that at an organizational level, I and mean, you're talking about it at like a country level here, that people are thinking about 
what the risks are like because in that messaging if if that process is done well can say like yes we are instituting this change and please see that we are also thinking about how to keep things safe whatever safe means yeah. in that context so yeah Something we're culturally idea. aligned yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alli- right. Alignment does it. Because if you think of change as like this continuum, if you're like throwing this switch to the all the way, because our brains are very apt to think about things in a binary way. So like we're changing things. People assume immediately you're going from zero to 100. And alignment does not look like that. Alignment is we are balancing all the things that matter. And some of those might look like brakes that we're putting on AI. And some of that might look like gas pedals. But alignment means we are aligning that in a in a safe and considered way is is what makes people the least resistant to change is when they can feel that you are aligning for the things that, that make them nervous. Definitely. Very awesome. And hopefully demystifying it. You know, I think some yeah. of it too is the, the fear of change is, you know, the unknown. You know, I don't know what this looks like. What is this act? How does this actually play out? And so hopefully breaking that down and hopefully we'll do some of that today as well. And sharing just what what this change actually looks like. What is this process? What even are the aspects of AI that might be introduced to a, a, an organization? And how does Absolutely. that actually work? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, Which is especially hard if like, you're the person who knows about it and is all excited about it. You're coming in at this like high level. You can see for a million miles about what's possible about this thing. You have to come back and remind yourself that the person you're talking to has not participated in all those thoughts and considerations. And they haven't seen you go, oh, yeah, but we're not going to do that because that's actually not a good idea. They haven't seen that whole track. I mean, this applies to anything you're trying to message in an organization is is helping people have line of sight to the thought and consideration and care that was put into a decision helps give them reasons to calm their own nervous system around what is changing. And when you just come in and I mean, I think we see this in our families all the time. Someone can say like, oh, we're we're doing this thing. You're like, wait, what? Huh? Huh? And then you hear what went into it. And you're like, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. But your your brain needs that. Um, this I, I want to just introduce this. Um, I know we we're going to get to it here in a second. But my favorite uh, change management theory is just wonderfully simple. And I think it gives a great context for just about any kind of new thing you want to institute in an organization. And it's um, it was a social scientist from the 50s named Kurt Lewin. And it he, he uses the metaphor of an ice block, that you can't change the shape of an ice block while it's still an ice block. I mean, unless you're sculpting it into a dragon or something. I guess that sort of counts, but, <laughs> but, but let's, not, let's not go there. Um, if you want to make it a different shape, you first you have to unfreeze it, which in an organizational mode, that means like dissolving the resistance, which means being patient with the resistance, acknowledging this resistance, not poo-pooing the resistance and not looking down on it. Like you have to really sink into empathy and patience and consideration about how people are going to feel and what kind of resistance they're going to have. So that's the unfreezing phase. That's the part most people skip. They want to just jump into, they think of change management as I'm going to announce what the change is and then we'll really work with people to make it stick and and to reinforce it and establish it and normalize it. So there's this first process um, which I loved, Tim, that you were you were saying like that is the part that that your new program is really helping with people like unfreeze what's already there. Then you create that change. So this is the transition period of any new thing, and then you refreeze it in the new shape. And then it doesn't end there. That's when you have to establish norms and reinforce things and um, and reward the behavior that we want. That's a whole process on its own, but. But the change in the refreeze, I think we're a little bit more accustomed to. It's the unfreezing part that I think isn't. Yeah, let's dig into that. Because that, you know, that was something we talked about in our prep calls. Um, And I think that's where a lot of people are going to get major value from our conversation Mm -hmm. today. Uh, Because, you know, we see these awesome tools. Like people are like, oh, check out the newest feature, you know, the the new feature of GPT-4 Vision that's coming out. Like, it is really impressive of what it can do. And that's amazing. But as we just drop these things in and be like, okay, now we're using this. People are like, what? what for what? What do we do with it? Like, how does it work? Right. So what, what, what you and I were talking about was uh, my experience at United Healthcare in our culture training. The first thing we had to do in culture training was the unfreezing session. It was mm-hmm. the session to like, okay, 
that's, those are behaviors you used to do. Um, and here's why you did them. And that to recognize that before going into, okay, now here's the new stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. So take us through some strategies here, Jody, to unfreeze ourselves. How do we unfreeze ourselves, unfreeze organizations? What do you, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So, so a couple things. Um, there is a, this one's really simple. And then the next one has a lot of threads to it. So I'm going to do this one first. There's something called the endowment effect. And these are all, these are all just like facts about the human brain for better or for worse. They almost seem like glitches sometimes, but, um, but it's just how our brains work. So you can't ignore them. So the endowment effect is, is the part of our brain that assigns more value to something you already have than something new. It assigns that value without regard to like a comparative, you know, a comparative assessment. And I, I won't bore you with the whole studies, but the, um, the, the best way to think of it is when you try to go through your a bookshelf or your closet and get rid of things, you're like, mm, I might want that some other time. I, mm -hmm. you know, I like you assign value to it versus if you can find ways to clean that slate and say like, would I, um, would I buy that book again? Would I buy that sweater again? That doesn't always get you quite there because it's hard to replicate the true like clean slate of the freshness. But a lot of times the answer is no, I wouldn't buy that book today. And so it can probably go. And you know, when we saw this a lot was during COVID, people were forced to rethink their processes. And when we went to check my son into college, um, they, because of COVID, they had to, instead of having everybody park their cars and go into the gym and find this table and get your key. And it was this, apparently it was mayhem. There were like stories from years past of just absolute mayhem on, on freshman orientation check-in day. But they had designed this instead because of COVID and only because of COVID. They had designed this drive-through process where you were assigned a time to show up throughout the day. You got in line. They gave you your key. You drove to this other spot where somebody gave you the carts. It was this whole process designed for lower contact, you know, again, because of COVID. And I was talking to the head of, of the admissions program later that day. We were just like walking through campus and chatting. And she said, it's so amazing. She said, we would have never thought to do this, but we will never do it the old way again. Right. Like until right. we were forced to think of this. And we have thought about mm -hmm. how could we redo this process? And what you do is you make like incremental decisions. You're like, well, I guess we could, you know, have more tables in the gym. You know, like you, 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 it's hard to break out of that. So you just have to know that people hold on to what they have. And so you have to find ways for pattern breaks. So I'll just toss that one out there um, as, as a thing. So here's the real... Oh, God. I would say as well as creative constraints, you know, and that's oh, where my goodness. Yes. there's so much value. Like if you just get a blank canvas, oh. a lot of people freeze at that. Totally. But if you're told like, draw this, or you have an outline on that canvas already. A hundred percent. You know, and, and so the drive through process is a great example of that because it, it wasn't that they, you know, as you know, like as, as you were just describing, it was not that they could have just said, okay, blow it all up. How do we want to do it? It's right. like, no, 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 blow it all up, but we cannot do the following thing. We cannot yes. have contact. We cannot have people gathering in a place. So how I, do we go uh, about this, this? I do this a lot with my one-on-one -on -one clients, and I always have to preface it until they sort of learn that I do this. I'll say like, okay, a lot of times I'm asking diagnostic questions. These are not, these are not actual suggestions because I don't want them worried like, well, I can't do that. I'm like, that's not the point. So I'll take away like a whole set of variables. I'm like, if this, this, this didn't exist, what would you do? What if this, this, and this didn't exist? What would you notice? And if you if you can isolate variables, it helps the brain focus. We're just our brains have not caught up to the world that we live in, and we we are our brains look for contrast, they look for simplicity, they look for they look for threat mitigation. And this is really going to be the bulk of what we talk about here. Is our brain's primary job is to keep us alive. And when push comes to shove, when there's not enough energy, when there's any kind of threat, all the blood rushes to the, you know, the reptilian part of the brain, which is all about fight, fight, flight, freeze, those kinds of things. Our prefrontal cortex, which is our smart and savvy brain, that one takes way more fuel and it does not get to decide when it gets fuel and when it does not. So you, you have to recognize anything that pushes someone into that part of their brain, you are no longer talking to their 
really savvy nuance. To what degree that's true depends on the person and the situation and how threatened they're feeling. But um, you cannot overlook the fear. So that is the word that I, like if you were looking for alignment, look for fears and do not blow them off. So this would be true for anything, but let's actually pause for a moment to be, before I even talk about the sort of more nuanced ways that fears show up in organization, which I would normally talk about. If, you know, if you're not familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that very first level that, and the, you know, the concept is it's a triangle and, and you have to at least somewhat satisfy any given layer before you can address a higher level. And so the very bottom layer is just survival, basic survival needs. And then all the way at the top is like enlightenment. And what I think it, we have to not overlook here is that for some people in some industries, AI can legitimately, at least potentially, be an existential threat. Mm-hmm. Like there are people, if we pretend that there aren't people for whom their entire careers might go away, that is that is that is ridiculous. You know, my, my father-in-law was a textile designer from Scotland who literally with individual threads would design men's suits, which was a powerhouse industry in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. When casual, you know, business casual came and not everyone was wearing a suit every day, that business, it didn't go away, but it became a very, very like only insert that in fast fashion. Um, that is just not an industry that really exists. That happens in the world. And so you can't overlook that. And if, and you, and you can't gaslight people about it either. You can't just say like, oh, we're going to protect your jobs. Shit. If you really mean that and you know how that's happening, then then great. But, um, you know, name them and addressing what you're working with them. Maybe the messaging has to be, we're not sure that this specific set of jobs will exist five or 10 years from now. But we're also looking at this and this and ways that we can train on this and, you know, just address whatever is real and be honest with people. People do not like to be um, handled like you were managed. Like we, most of us have a really good sniffer for that. And, uh, and I know we think we're being really savvy when we're like, we'll just tell them this, like they see through it. <laughs> um, right. so, so that's, so let's just put that as a side like, if there is a, le- if there is a legitimate, like existential threat to someone's career, name it. If there mm-hmm. isn't, name it and tell them why and how you can reassure them about that. Because if you can't make that go away, they're not going to hear any of the rest of the things we're going to talk about. So Trudy, it sounds like, I mean, I know you brought the blank sleep, but if I'm in, you know, in an organization that wants to adopt AI for a certain process, maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, a strategy would be to explain to the workforce what the objective is with implementing that AI. You know, is it to help this certain department work faster so they can shift some of their time towards more creative or strategic initiatives? Um, Is it, you know, like maybe really thinking mission first as opposed to just we're adopting this because this is going to help us save costs, but really understanding what is the actual mission or objective? Is that a strategy here? A hundred percent. It's it it all just like I, I always try to look for like the most broadly applicable construct you can use and everything you said is true. And there, that goes back down to this fundamental principle of, of, be as transparent as you can. And trans I don't mean right. transparent as like honesty, because most people hear it that way. And so they assume transparent about things that they would hide. It's not that. It it comes back to something I actually learned from a parenting book one time. They're like, if you want kids to be good at, say, being patient, you have to narrate you being patient. Like you're in the store and you're standing there waiting in a long line. They don't know you're being patient. They don't, they don't see that that's what is happening, that you are digging deep to be patient because you kind of want to throw yourself on the floor and like kick and scream because this line is taking so long. So <laughs> to say like, I am feeling frustrated that this is taking so long. And so I am taking some deep breaths to be patient. Like that's how they learn. Otherwise, they don't even know that's happening. And so as a leader, just like, I think we overlook the enormous deep value of just sharing your thoughts and how you got to a thing and what's going on. It it comes back to that, like give people a why, but it's just bigger than that. Like it's just sharing what you see from your line of sight because you more Mm. often than not have a much bigger line of sight than they do. And there are a lot of times things you can't share for reasons of confidentiality or, or organizational proprietary, you know, whatever. 
But whatever you can share helps the smart people in your organization be smart with you because they are also operating with the information that you are operating with, as opposed to thinking of it as um, like manipulating, like, like, you know, like, what if I say it this way, I'll get this reaction or not get this reaction. That's not communicating. That is control and, and trying to like get a reaction out of someone. And it's more like, I'm going to give you the information you need to also see with me that this has possibility. doesn't mean they're always going to agree with you. I don't mean this to sound like, like Pollyanna, but but it is a big, so you're absolutely on the right track there. To bring them along for the journey as opposed to going forth in the journey and telling them that this is, you know, we're already at, at point C, but we didn't show you point A, point B to point C and, and what that journey looked like to get to that. Yep. And yeah. all of those things take time. And I know everyone feels time crunched, but the amount of time it saves you on the other end of it is exponential. So it is always, always worth that that pause. Um, I do want to point out though that that fears, and this is this is true in every place in everyone's lives, but I think it's especially important to understand at work where there is a sort of taboo um, about showing feelings or fears. Like it's very vulnerable to say, like, I feel like this makes me nervous or I'm afraid. You're always supposed to look like you have it together and you're cool and everything's good. Um, but again, back to brains, which we cannot, <laughs> we cannot get past the point that at the end of the day, the brain's in charge of how this is all going. Um, when you're, they actually, I've seen like the, the studies with the fMRIs or maybe it's PET scans, I can't remember. When your value feels threatened, which can be something as simple as, uh, someone saying, uh, can you step into the conference room with me for a minute? Like how many times you're like, oh my God, I'm being fired. Like it's, it's like everything's over. Like it's, um, it can be that simple. Not to mention something um, where your value feels threatened, like an existential threat. Or let's not overlook for a lot of people, this is so new. They might've tried a, something AI-ish at their house and they, they didn't get it, at least not the way you're seeing it. Um, or, and, and so people are, when your value feels threatened, when you feel like you look stupid, or you feel like you can't pick up something fast enough, or you're not getting it like other people. All of those things make your value and reputation feel threatened. And in that moment, this is what's on the scans, brains do the same thing as if like a tiger walked into the room. The, all the blood rushes to that fight or flight, and you're, you're scanning for, am I safe? Like, what do I need to do? And the degree to which that happens, obviously, varies, varies greatly. But you, and the degree to which any individual person can calm that their nervous system back down varies greatly. You know, some people can calm it right back down. Some people, once they're triggered like that, it takes like a day or two. So that's a great thing to remember. Side note, if you're ever having to give like bad news or have a tough conversation, keep it short and simple and have time to come back to it later. You can also work this into organizational change. Like you don't dump a thousand things on people because if you say anything that's going to elicit that kind of neurological response, remember what I said before, like they're literally unable to process the, with that really smart, nuanced part of their brain. And so they, they can't hear that. They, they might be nodding their heads and hearing it, but they're not going to remember it accurately. They're going to fill in the blanks later. So just recognizing that anything that feels threatening needs to be handed out in short blips and then giving people space and then coming back and unpacking it and to separate facts from fictions and fears and debunking fears and, you know, working on facts. Yeah. Like you were saying, Tally, like what this really does is frees you up to be able to do those things you don't ever get to do. Like the part of your job you love and you really want to do, but you can't because you have to do all this sloggy crap. Like now we have a way to get that done. And now you can actually use your brain for the stuff that you really want to be doing during the day. That's, yeah. and, people aren't going to resist that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're also hitting a very important topic here too, is um, making sure that people get ahead of the illusion uh, around AI specifically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, and, and we see this often, like one of the main questions that we get from people is, what is AI and what can I do with it? And when you have... Um, you know, whether it is executives, media outlets, just, you know, social media feeds, whatever it is, talking about, like, AI is coming to take a job. It's going to take all the jobs. It's taking every job. Like, 
if that's the narrative people are just bombarded with, mm -hmm. and it really is, then, you know, one of the key things, a key behavior in any organization should be for you to say, okay, here is how we would use artificial intelligence to achieve our business goals and what that means for you. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the main, you know, the main problem with that that we've seen is a lot of people don't have exposure to good use cases. Mm -hmm. Like, how would people use AI in this industry or that industry? And, you know, how do we think about how that impacts the team? And so, you know, I guess that's, you know, when I'm thinking about overall, from a behavior, from a preparing people perspective, just tying right in, Jody, what you're saying of managing that anxiety and fear, this is a simple behavior. You know, working with uh, groups or doing your own research to say, okay, here's how we would use AI. Here's our strategic objectives. Here's how AI enables them. And here's what that means for our team. And then sharing that with the team. One, you know. If 1,000% if, if was actually a thing that existed, I would say 1,000% yes to that. <laughs> like 100, 100%. The, because that's the other, it's actually 20, you, you can't see my notes, but if you had, that is almost literally my next point, which is get it out of the theoretical as quickly as you can. Because there, anything that has, this is the thing I listen for both with my one-on-one -on -one clients and as well as anytime I do organizational work, any place where people are referred to as a proper noun, like, well, legal does this, or da-da-da-da, or where, like, things are talked about in contexts um, versus the reality of how rubber meets the road, that is a place where you have to make sure that narratives, like popular narratives and binary thinking, aren't driving the perspective because mm -hmm. those things are always going to be reductionist down to snippets, and again with the brain, down to things that either create fear or safety, because that is what, and our brains, when our brains have to choose between fear and safety, they go for fear first, because you have to move away from a tiger before you worry about how to get into the tree. You mm -hmm. know, like, like they're, you will always gravitate towards, your brain is literally scanning for risk constantly. And that's why we're so good at identifying risk and we're so bad, like a risk of something being different. We're, we're actually quite bad at recognizing risk of staying the same. You know, I could do a whole talk about that. I won't dive into it right now, but that is a fundamental, fundamental flaw in the human operating system. But to your point, get it, imagine this for a second. And you could actually use this as a technique, perhaps like if, if I came into an organizational meeting and said, like, hey, we just bought this, this new software, you know, this new, this new SaaS product, that means you don't have to do X, Y, and Z anymore because it, I mean, think of all the things that already, you know, like, like the things that strip the contact information and put it in Salesforce so you don't, out of emails so that you don't have to do that. Like, people already understand automation, they, they, this isn't a completely foreign thing. It doesn't inherently warrant the kind of fear mongering that it, it's getting. So take it out of a place where there's space to make up stories about it and show them reality. And then if they have issues with the reality, you can debunk those and you can pick through them. Or you can say like, wow, actually, that's a great point. You know, they, when they're looking at a reality situation, who knows, they might, they might come up with a way that, or with a, you know, uh, an alert that says like, yeah, but if we do that, that might put the customer, customer at risk of experiencing this or, or whatever. They might see something that hasn't been noticed yet, but you're looking at reality and therefore it's worth discussing. You know, Brene Brown right. has that um, wonderful phrase to, uh, to, to use in personal situations. Like the story I'm making up is blah, 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 blah. And that gives the person the opportunity to say like, no, 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 that's not what's happening. This is happening. Or yeah, that is how I'm feeling. It's, I love that because it it makes the invisible visible of what narrative is driving people's thoughts and actions. And with this, if you go in talking about AI, it, like immediately everyone fills in the blanks with all the narratives they've compiled thus far. Mm -hmm. um, right. And and so not that you hide you're going to talk about AI, but say like, hey, you know, here are some places where 
I think we all agree that these processes are are a slog. You know, they're an absolute, just laborious part of our day. Like this part could go away or here's a challenge we have that there's never been a way to get around and now we can. I mean, that's, you and I were talking last week, like that's been my very, very, very recent experience with AI, like a revelatory um like get out of jail for something that with my learning, particular learning issues has always been a real challenge. It's the the create from scratch thing. Like I can't create from scratch. I need something to react to, literally can't. Um, And when I realized that it could give me really great fodder to react to, all of a sudden I now have daily social media posts just because I had something to start with that was specific to my business. That sounds like a small thing. It has literally been a game changer, Uh, like literally a game changer. So, so that's big, but I couldn't see that if someone had shown me that use case and also, Oh, this gets into one other point I want to make. It kind of goes into that like fear of looking stupid thing. Um, Do not overlook. I think we all had a lot of fun sort of laughing at our parents on Facebook and whatnot, where they would post on, you know, they would post to their timeline, like a message to someone, you know, my mom still doesn't quite understand what's her page versus a private message versus whatever. We've all had a really good time laughing at all of that. Guess what? It's, it's our turn. Like, <laughs> like there are things I catch myself sometimes. I, when I first started using Instagram, my daughter came in one day and she's like, mom, what are you doing? That's like, you posted that story four times. Well, I thought it wasn't going. Like, so I just right. kept posting it because it kept popping up with the, with the post thing. And so I just kept hitting it. You know, like I'm 50, so it's not like I'm 80, but you know, very, very, very small thing. I think when most people my age and even a little younger first opened up chat GPT, we typed in questions like you typed them into Google. Yeah. And that, and then not unsurprisingly, you know, not surprisingly, we the not, not a lot of great stuff comes out. And so I see people referencing that all the time. Like, like what it's really no better than Google, like blah, 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 blah. So that, so this is the other piece to it is listening When you hear irritating questions or like when you're frustrated by someone not getting something, listen to exactly what they're saying because the clues in there for what their learning barrier is, they're in the question. The fact that they think that, that tells you exactly what piece they're not able to see. Um, You, uh, I think it was Tally who said something about the, the, they don't have a construct for it. He said it very early in the show. People need, a. It, I think of it as like a bookshelf. If they don't have a bookshelf yet to put what you, the, the book that you're handing them, the wisdom that you're, that you're giving them or the thing you're teaching them, if they don't have a construct for it yet, it literally doesn't have a place to go and they put it down. And mm-hmm. I've seen this in clients that I've had for years and years and years. And one day I say something that, honest to God, I've said like a hundred times. And they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, like, and suddenly they can hear it or, or they'll come in and say someone else mentioned it and, and it landed. I, I don't take that. I don't get frustrated by that because it just means that they're, they finally have the mm-hmm. construct for it. They have a bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Like when that thought landed, they had a place to put it. I wish I could remember how you said it, Tally, because um, so you have to build people the construct first. And to your point, Tim, giving them the reality of how they're going to use it. And giving them, maybe even starting out with that so they can, or some real life scenarios that they can then run each process through before you're talking about it in a big narrative way. Because all you're going to do then is just fill in with narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And and ownership on top of that. Like, you know, help people be inspired to own the transformation, own the change. That, And a lot of times people are like, well, but nobody's going to own getting rid of their work. And I consistently have seen with our clients, with people I've worked with, that's not true. Like people consistently are looking for what's an easier, faster, better way of doing this that yeah. I don't have to do. And so, um, you I, know, I internally. It, it, I would add to that, like, like what comes in my mind for ownership is participation. And when, when yes. you have people participate in a decision, then, and it doesn't have to be the whole thing. Like, like I'm not saying, the, I'm not talking about like decisions by committee where you get the entire organization to make a big decision. Not that. You find discrete, um, you know, it, it takes some work to think about the right way to do it. But when you need to make change, 
if you can help them, if you can give them part of the process to participate in, any part of it, then you get their brain going. There's, there's, um, oh, I'm not going to remember what this called. There's, um, there's an article called the neuroscience of leadership that talks about this, but, but like, if you're telling somebody something, even if they're like shaking their head and like, yep, 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 that's a good idea. Like neurons are not firing, synapses are not connecting. Whereas if you can ask them questions or get them, like you can feel it. There are things that ignite your brain where you have to think about it to like help. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see how that connects to that. Then you are actually creating the synapses where, and that's where, you know, ownership, the word you use, that isn't just a mindset thing. You can mm-hmm. reinforce that with actual like neural pathways because they have helped figure it out. It, it's the difference in using ways and finding your own way there. Mm-hmm. Like you can use ways and then maybe the next time not remember how you got to that place. That's kind of what you do to people's brains when you just like tell them that they have to do a new thing. They're mm-hmm. like, okay, okay. Like, but they didn't learn. They didn't participate. They didn't grapple. That's my favorite word these days. Like let people grapple with something and then their brain like turns on and locks in and gets excited. And once you're excited, then you automatically have ownership instead of just like, daggone it, why don't they take ownership? I'm like, well, they didn't, you just like dropped a dog off at their house. That's different than like they got to pick the dog. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, definitely. So so just to, I guess, summarize here, it sounds like really what, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's the thaw, the unfreezing. So really making sure that we're addressing people's concerns. Um, we're bringing people along for the journey. We have a clear mission and goal. Hopefully it's to make the lives of the people that we're working with easier. Um, and then we have this rearrange phase where we really go through and, um, you know, like Tim said, we're, we're thinking about different use cases, different ways to actually in, uh, implement the new technology. I know Human AI Pathways has a lot of different strategies for that piece. Yeah, and then I'm we sure have, you guys could do like 10 episodes on that part. But. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And then we have the refreeze piece, which would be, you know, uh, re-instilling uh, habits um, mm-hmm. for future processes, making sure, I think you mentioned this, Jody, we're incentivizing properly, and that's kind of a continued process in itself. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Is there anything you guys would add to that? I think the only thing I would add is that both in that middle phase, the, the moving things around transitional phase, and then absolutely in the refreezing phase, is what what also has to happen in there is that patience and and continuing to resolve dissolve resistance because as as like let's say you somebody's great with that first step in the change well it's like the change clock starts over again sometimes depending on what it is like now they they've they've gotten mm-hmm. that part of it but like every solution comes with a new set of problems this is true in all things business like Every time you fix a thing, like now there are new problems to have. In fact, that's a joke I have with my clients a lot. We're like, oh my gosh, you have new problems. You must be making progress. <laughs> like, that's, uh, <laughs> that's what progress feels like is a new problem. But there are always new problems with every solution. And so you don't get frustrated with people when, you know, they, they made a few changes and now suddenly they're resisting again. Like the next bit, the resistance will keep popping up. Just know that. Take a deep breath. Dissolve it. Keep moving. So it's that reinforcing, rewarding feedback loops. Because last bit on that, if you, one of the values of getting people involved in this process in a way and getting them to change is that they might, uh, some of their resistance might be because they have unearthed things that are a problem in what you are, the change that you are trying to create. Like, don't go into this imagining that your change is perfect as it is. Like, it might be flawed. In fact, I would say it probably is flawed in at least some tiny way. What in the world is perfect? So that is the other reason to be incredibly patient and empathetic and absorb with respect and value of their perspective of what they're seeing. Because sometimes they see something that you can't because you're not in that job. You don't spend every day in that. I I do hear that often, like a frustration for you do lose touch with what happens at the boots on the ground level of things. And so in order to do really effective change, you have to listen to the feedback that you get and vet it quickly so that you're not bogged down by it. But but know that sometimes they are actually seeing something you can't. And so yeah. there's that as well. And we, we often say only the people doing the work know the work. 
Right. Uh, and yes. we had a, a use case I love pointing to is we were working with a team and the manager was like, we have the seven, it's a seven step process to do this activity. And we're like, okay, great. And so they map out the process for us. We meet with the people who actually do the work and you know, that seven step process was missing a zero at the end. It was a 70 step (laughs) process. And we're like, Oh wow, this is a lot different. And and every time the manager was sitting in the room while the person was explaining this, he's like, Oh, I didn't know we do that. And and the person doing the process was like, Oh, remember we added this when such Mm -hmm. and such condition came up. Mm -hmm. No, I don't remember that at all. So really, you know, you, uh, one of the keys to success with AI is, you know, everything you know, we're talking about here is super, super important. And, you know, I hope people are taking away, engage the team doing the work. Mm-hmm. Be clear. Like, say, here's what we're thinking. Here's why we're thinking. Here's how we got to this place. Here's what's real in the world of AI, not the fantasy stuff that's being pitched all over the place. So, you know, that reality check Man, that's so important. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, no, I, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so time check. Um, this has been a great oh, conversation, wow. but uh, <laughs> we need to get on the wins. So, yes. Tally, you want to kick us off? What's your win this week? Yeah, so I was just, um, you know, searching around the world of AI and seeing if there was anything that I should be aware of. And I was actually, this is really relevant to me this week. I just saw an article from The Verge about um, Google Maps making a, a couple updates, um, adding AI features to one, um, add something called an immersive view. So to make existing features um, like driving directions easier to follow. But then the second piece, which I was excited about, is integrating this um, AI into the search functionality and updating that within the Google Maps. So that way you can not only search for things like, you know, I don't know, um, where's your nearest Chipotle, but also ask things like um, fall foliage, which is kind of interesting, or or something more abstract or vague, uh, like latte art. And so this AI tool will go through existing relevant images or reviews from all different locations. And so you can look up and see these different, um, you know, find fun things to do in Denver, things like that. And so instead of me going to a search engine to Google this, and then going back to the maps to find all this, there's actually a, I'm located out in Denver right now, and there's a running post of like the exact timing or, you know, a few days where you get like the peak um, fall foliage for certain hikes. And hmm. so that could be integrated into the um, the map. So that way you can actually see that visibly around That's your location. So cool. uh, these features. So I just thought that was really cool and a really great way to use AI. So I wanted to shout that out. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Lead me. Jody, what's your win this week? Well, I was going to have a different win. I had a different win prepared, but when I said that, um, what I was talking about for me, this like tiny little AI thing has been such a game changer. Last night, right before I went to bed, um, I got a message from a woman who, uh, who, anyway, I got my very first, because I've been doing that, and because for three weeks I've had daily posts on social media, I got a client out of it. And the woman literally nice. said, I've known you for a while. Um, but I, and I kind of knew you did something businessy <laughs> is what her message <laughs> said. She's like, but, um, I saw one of your posts and I went and I looked at your Instagram and I realized that's exactly what I need. And she literally was like, so I went ahead and bought this thing. And here's the thing, Tim, like I've been doing this work 20 years and I, the running joke is that nobody can describe what I do. And in fact, uh-huh. my friend Andrew once in, it actually introduced me as like Jody Hume. She's the best in the world at whatever it is that she does. <laughs> um, so it has been this like amorphous, nameless thing. And for someone to just look at a like, couple weeks of posts and totally get it, and she did. She really got it. She knew exactly what I did. And that to me, when I said game changer, like that is not hyperbole. That is That is amazing. And that I really do credit that to plunking around on chat GPT and sort of discovering this way to have a, a felt like a thought partner almost. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. And that's cool. an awesome win. Congratulations. Yeah. Big win clapping for, for you. Clap, clap, thank, clap. You. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, you? Cool. Yeah. My win this week. Um, so I, I feel like I have a, a bunch of wins this week. So number one, I always, anyone who talks to me, I always got a book recommendation for everybody. Cause I love to read. Um, yeah, as a struggling reader growing up, 
like now that I've kind of worked through my process on how to read, I love reading and, you know, really sharing that out with everybody. Um, Be Useful by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I really, really enjoyed it. Quick read. Um, if you get the audio book, he's the narrator. So know what you're getting <laughs> into. Um, but uh, um, that's one. Uh, and then Adobe Max, uh, which is Adobe's creative conference, was last or what, last week, two weeks ago. And um, still seeing all this content came out from it. Um, lots of focus on AI. But it led me to this guy. He's a photographer named Thomas Johnson. And he, his photography is brightly colored fabrics in the wind in like gorgeous locations. And so he creates, they're basically wind sculptures with these fabrics and it's all like kinetic, real analog content. So, um, I believe it is, uh, I mean, I got the website right here. I wanted to share with y'all. It is, um, uh, I'm oh, sorry, Thomas Jackson photography.com. Hmm. Uh, not AI related, but gorgeous photography that really just amazingly good stuff to inspire you. So cool. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today on the boring AI show.